so today as we celebrate Christmas, who better to talk about than Jesus, the one that we celebrate. As you already know, Christmas is one of the uh, most celebrated holidays in the world. As a matter of fact, it is the most celebrated religious holiday in the world, celebrated by billions of people. And sometimes when we do some things, we have to ask ourselves, what is the point? Why is it that we do it? You know, there is crowd mentality. You do what everybody is doing. Uh, there are, you know, things that are done by sects of people. I, I celebrate Christmas because Christians celebrate Christmas, and I'm a, I'm a Christian. Uh, but I, I want us to press beyond that this time, just uh, as I share the word of God with you. Why is Christmas one of the most celebrated um, Holiday? Is it because it's winter season? I don't think so. Is it because of the gift exchange? I think that that's probably a little bit part of it, right? Is it because of the songs and the carols? Yeah, they are beautiful. But the reason Christmas is important and is celebrated is is celebrated is the person that is being celebrated at Christmas and what he came to do. The person. You, you know that Christmas really is just a, a combination of the word Christ's mass, okay? So it's the mass that is done in celebration of the birth of Christ, all right? And somehow all of that gets lost in, in the holiday festivity. But it's the mass, like Catholics who celebrate mass or hold their, their, their religious services, is the mass for the birth of Christ. And that's what we know as Christmas. So it's all about Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, if you look around, it's been commercialized. I know you know that. It's it's celebrated by billions of people that will fill churches today and those that will not go to church for wrong reasons with different focus. It's become something that is more like just gift exchange and buying toys and things like that. But we must be careful that that doesn't... uh, also happened to us that that's all Christmas is about. For example, this past week, I saw a news, um, news um, article online about an 80-year-old man with his 83-year-old uh, wife arrested. Why were they arrested? They were carrying 60 pounds of marijuana in their truck. And when the police arrested them, they said, oh, it's Christmas gifts. No, seriously, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a true story. They said they were driving from one state to the other, I think from Vermont to the other, Boston, to distribute it to their family members as Christmas gift. 60 pounds, what over $300,000 of marijuana. So when you look at that, does that person or do those people have any idea what Christmas is about? Absolutely not. Do you see? And so if we're not careful, there are certain things that take over the significance of spiritual things, and it all becomes buying and selling and giving and all those things, which there's nothing wrong with, except, you know, somebody that is even buying something that is completely against what is being celebrated. So what is the purpose? It is the person, and it is what he came to do. The person that was born is Jesus the Savior. I want you to look at Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. The person that is being celebrated, Jesus himself. The Bible says he is the Savior. Then the angel said to them, Luke chapter 2, verse 10, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Why? Not because of Santa Claus, Not because of a lot of gifts or Christmas tree, verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That is what ought to be the most important thing on the minds of people celebrating Christmas. Don't let that get lost. the, the, The angel said, You should rejoice because today a savior is born to you. Not a politician is born to you. It's not a celebrity or some kind of genius or some kind of a a scientific inventor. We have a lot of that already. But he said, somebody that the world doesn't have, a savior of humanity, was born at this time that we are now commemorating right now 
2,000 years ago, a savior. Not just another man. But the question is, there are a lot of people that celebrate the Christmas, but they do not know the savior of the Christmas. Now, what did he come to do? To save us from our sins. You say, well, pastor, I know that. Don't worry, just track with me. We're going somewhere with this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 21 says, But while he thought about these things, this is Joseph, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I want you to notice that the coming of Jesus to the world is focused. It has a precise reason it's coming. I share with you before, he's not coming as a celebrity. He's not coming just as another religious leader. Jesus didn't come to bring us religion. Jesus didn't come to, to, so that he can have some people going, that they will have somewhere to go on Sundays. I say, well, okay, at least I'm going to church. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come so that um, we, can, we can say, well, we, we, he has fans. He has millions of fans in the world. No, 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 no. The Bible says specifically, he came to save me, to save you from our sins and the everlasting consequences of our sins. That's what the Bible says. And that is why Christmas is the most important religious celebration that we can have. The question is, as you celebrate Christmas, are you sure that this Savior has fulfilled his purpose for coming in your life? That's, that's the bottom line. You know, lots of people will celebrate many, many Christmases. But when they meet with this Savior, it, at the end of the day, he will say, well, my mission failed in your life because you did not allow it to work. Depart from me. So as, I am, as we are speaking about Christmas this morning, it's great to buy those gifts. Trust me, I know everybody enjoys it. The, the, the stores make a lot of money from it. Everybody is happy to get something under the tree. My question is, the mission that the Savior came to accomplish, which is to save his people from their sin, has that been fully accomplished in your life? If it hasn't, what's your point of celebrating Christmas? Because you can celebrate it all you want, but in the end, mission unaccomplished. God doesn't do anything without a purpose. He will, his, even the name Yeshua, which means Savior, is given to him because he's not coming to save us from so many other things that we focus on, even though he does deliver us from all kinds of consequences of sin. But the, majority, the major part of why he's coming is to save his people from their sin. I, I've thought about this um, this way before in the past. When you say you are saving somebody, let's say from a car wreck, an accident, is it possible you can save a victim of a car crash from that wreckage and the person is still inside there? Then the person has not been saved. <laughs> is it that the person has been saved and removed from the car wreckage or the person is still there? Take, for example, an animal plunges into a hole, into some of these manholes or something, and the rescuer come and they say, we're going to save this pet, this dog or whatever from these things. Now, by the time they are done, do you expect that animal to still be in the manhole? No. If it is still there, it has not been saved. Get the picture. If Jesus has saved you from sin, what are you still doing in sin? That means he hasn't saved you probably. That's, that's what I'm saying. That if somebody says, well, yeah, I, I know Jesus. Jesus says, well, Matthew chapter 1 verse the past 20, 21 says, I am coming to save you from, out of. That's what from means. All right? If the Savior came and we celebrate that he has saved us, and the Savior looks, the Savior looks at our lives and says, well, but I still see sins around you. It's either you have been saved from or you are still in. Does anybody get my picture? So I want to call our attention 
to the most important thing. Do not forget the reason for Christmas. Do not forget the reason why is, the song says joy to the world. Do not forget the reason why the angel says rejoice because unto you today is born a Savior in the city of David, right? Jesus, the Savior, goodwill towards men. Why? Because the Savior will take them out of sin and the consequences of sin. And so, far from identifying with a religion, that's not why Jesus came. No, he came to deliver us. So, I've shared two things in summary of what Christmas is. The person, Jesus. The purpose, to save us. But that's not all the Bible says. That's just summary. There are other questions that the Bible helps us to answer. For example, how can Jesus be the Savior of the world? Okay, we get it, he's the Savior, but how can he be the Savior of the world? What characteristics does he have to be the Savior of the world? Many people have claimed to be Savior. You understand? So, what conditions are we in that is taking us away from? All those questions, you ought to be able to answer very well as a believer. Now, listen to this. If you have had an experience of something, you'll be able to recount your experience. If you have not had an experience, everything will be theory. And so, if you have been saved, you must have certain experiences that you can share with somebody that this is how Jesus is a Savior because I have had that experience. So, I want us to look at a little bit more than just those two things I have said. And the Bible helps us with this concerning Jesus. How is he a savior? What is he saving us from? Just beyond sin. Isaiah chapter 9 is going to help us. We're going to read verse 1 to 7. So please turn your scriptures there. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 to 7. Because if we miss all of this, it's just another holiday that has no meaning for us other than Temporary. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 7. Uh, this is one of the prophecies about Jesus through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was the prophet that spoke mostly about Jesus, uh, perhaps second to, uh, or I, I would think even beyond um, David. David spoke a lot about Jesus, but Isaiah spoke a lot of prophecies about Jesus 700 years before Jesus was born. Verse 1, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And when, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. These are two uh, places in Palestine, in, in, in Israel. And afterward, more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Notice the word there, gloom. I keep reading. Verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandals, from the noisy battle and garment rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and ever forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I want to believe if you're a believer, if you've been in any Christmas service, you probably have heard this scripture. I want to believe so. Even if you have not heard it read, you've heard it sung. For unto us a child is born. You've heard it. My question is, what does it mean? Everything I've read, seven verses, what does it mean? Well, you said, that's your job, pastor, to explain it, right? Okay. That's why I read it, so we can explain it. This passage that I've read answers some questions about how can Jesus be our Savior? What characteristics does Jesus possess to be our Savior? Th that is what this passage is covering. Number one, I want you to know this. The question, how can Jesus be the Savior of the world? 
One of the answers is because he's the one that brings light into man's darkness. Did you catch here? Verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. Darkness and light. The re- one of the reasons why Jesus is the Savior of the world is that he's the one that brings light into man's darkness. The light that we need is not the light from electricity. If that's all we need, then there will be no evil in the world. There will be no darkness in the world. But Jesus, Isaiah prophesying what Jesus will do when he will come, he says, the people that were sitting in Naphtali, in the, in the area of Galilee, they are living in darkness. That doesn't mean they don't have sunshine. But spiritually, they are living in darkness because there is no light in them. He said, but when the Savior comes, he will give light unto them. How can Jesus be the Savior? He's the one that brings joy into gloom, into doom, into sadness. Notice that in verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom, the doom, the, the depression will not be upon her who is distressed as when, uh, as it was at first. Verse 3, look at what Jesus does. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Jesus is the one that brings joy into a place where there is gloom and doom and depression. And I will explain how that is as I go on. Number three, how can he be the savior of the world? He's the one that breaks Satan's burden and delivers man from his oppression. Look at verse four. You have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. As in the day of Midian. Jesus is the one that delivers man from the oppression of the devil. That is how he is the savior of the world. Number four. He is the one that brings war to an end and replaces it with peace. He brings war into, uh, to an end. He replaces war with peace. Verse five. For Every warrior standards from the noisy battle. This is their gears to go and fight. Guess what? They will not need it anymore. The garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. They will turn them into, you know, things to burn and generate heat because there is no need for war anymore. That's why the Bible says of his, uh, the increase of his kingdom and of peace, there will be no end. That's why they are going to burn the instruments of war. So, Jesus... He's the savior of the world because, number one, he turns our darkness into light. Number two, he removes us from the dark depression of the devil and brings us joy and rejoicing. Number three, because he's the one that breaks the burden, the yoke of Satan from man and sets them free from the oppression of the enemy. And number four, he brings war, both external and internal warfare of mankind to an end, replaces it with peace. Now, we, a lot of uh, things we could say about this to expand shared it. But for a moment, I want to move to the next question without even necessarily expanding on this yet. What characteristics does Jesus have to do all these things? It's one thing that is going to give us light. It's one thing that's going to set us free. You know, those, that's hunky-dory. But what personality, what does he possess to do that? The scripture tells us. Right there. The, what Jesus has to do these things for you and for me is found in his name. Why? Verse 6, he says, For unto us a child is born, and a son is given to us. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be, number one, wonderful. Now, you have to understand that in the Hebrew language and in some other culture, for example, Nigerian culture, most African cultures, I take it, we don't just give name to people for naming, naming sake. You know, you are stone or you are cutlass or whatever. No, we give people name that have significance, right? Something that has to do with maybe the circumstance when they're around when they were born, what you are intending that that person will be or whatever. So in the Hebrew culture, the names that were given to the children were very specific. So the name of Jesus that you're going to read here will reveal to you what Jesus possessed to be your Savior and to be my Savior. And notice one interesting thing there. This verse doesn't say, say his names. What does it say? 
his name singular shall be called, then he lists like four or five names. So wait a minute. Is that a grammatical error? No. No. Why is this so? The reason it's so is he's one person, and all the names that are mentioned, they are just his attributes, all of them bound up in who he is. All of them bound up in who he is. So let's take the first one. Wonderful. Wonderful just means something that is astonishing, something you cannot explain, something that is beyond uh, your explanation, something hard to fathom, something amazing. You just leave it as it is. Well, that is one of the name of Jesus. Now, there are, um, you know, preachers and teachers and, and commentaries that put this name together, Wonderful Counselor. And it sounds good. The reason is because if you look at the other names, Wonderful Counselor uh, sounds like, okay, it could be a couple because we have Prince of Peace, we have Everlasting Father, you have these names that are kind of coupled together. But there are also reasons and arguments for uh, the name, actually the first two being individual, Wonderful, then Counselor. So for now, we're going to take it as individual names. Uh, you know, separate on their own. Wonderful. The only one qualified to be called wonderful is Jesus. I'm talking about what does he have to save you and do all those good things I've said. Yeah, because he's wonderful. And I will explain. Everything about Jesus is wonderful. There is nothing about this Jesus that we are celebrating that is ordinary. Let's start, for example, with his birth. His birth had been predicted from Genesis chapter 3, way at the beginning of the world. When man fell, God said, okay, well, here is your punishment, but there is a seed coming that would destroy the head of the serpent, way back in Genesis 3. How did God know that? Well, because he's God. Uh, I doubt if your mother knew she was going to have you until she got pregnant, <laughs> Right? But no, 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 Jesus had been foretold from way back about him coming and what he's going to do. That sets him apart. His, his birth was prophesied by so many prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah being one of them. His birth was announced by an angel. His, his birth was by a virgin uh, woman. That is wonderful because it has not been replicated. His birth... He was born of the Holy Spirit. So if we start with his birth alone, Jesus already is a different person. Because everything about his birth is wonderful. Remember the question Mary asked, how shall this be? Yeah, that is a question of, mm, I can't understand that. How am I going to have a child? I don't, even, I don't even know a man intimately. Right, because the one that was to come defies ordinariness. So when he says his name will be wonderful, he himself is the embodiment of wonder, starting with how he was born. His nature is wonderful. Jesus is God who became man, but was fully God and still was fully man. That is his nature. Now, you cannot explain that fully because it's in his, in his, in his, uh, explicable. It is wonderful. The Bible says this Jesus that was born 2,000 years ago existed before creation. Remember John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning. So Jesus' nature sets him apart. The Bible says... The world became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the same I am that I am, as you see in the Old Testament. Remember one time he was talking to the, to the Pharisees. They were questioning him. Well, why are you talking like that? We, we, we are children of Abraham. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And that would have infuriated them because they knew when he uses the title I am, he's talking as if he's God. And he was talking as if he's God. That's why it's wonderful. 
How can this God that created everything condense himself to, to a little thing and come out of the womb of a teenage lady? That's why the Bible calls him wonderful. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, look at the name alone. I mean, I'm talking about wonderful. Everything about Jesus is wonderful. Look at that grammar. Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> all right, so if all you're looking at is grammar, you say, well, that's incorrect. You cannot put that together. You know the reason why the name of God and the name of Jesus is I am? The reason is God is always in the present. When you say something was, maybe it's at a point was, and it has changed. But the reason Jesus, the name of God can never be I was is he's unchangeable. He's always in the present from eternity past, present, and eternity to come. And Jesus says, that same God that spoke to Abraham, that same God that spoke to Isaac, Jacob, and all of them, Jesus says, is the one you're looking at. I am that God, Jesus. That's why it's wonderful. That's why it's wonderful. There is no other religious leader that has claimed to be God. They may claim to be prophet of God. Yeah? They may claim to be a messenger of God. They may claim to be whatever. But Jesus says, I am that same God of the Old Testament. And that's what sets him apart. Do you remember his name is called Emmanuel? Anybody remembers that? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us, with man. That's who Jesus is. So when you say in the name of Jesus, when you're saying you, are, you believe in Jesus, Jesus is saying all that God is, that's who I am. I am wonderful. I am man, but I am the same God because there are no two gods. Is equal with God. Do you know that God the Father actually called Jesus also God? Do you know that? So that it's not just the testi te testimony of man. God the Father calls God the Son God. It's right there in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, which is actually quoting from the book of Psalms. But I'll read the Hebrew uh, part. Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. He there is God the Father, says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, to the Son, he says... Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Wow. God says to God the Son, Your throne, O oh God, is forever. Okay, then it, that hits you out of the ballpark. Because if, if a man is saying, Jesus, you are God, he says, Well, the man is mistaken. Well, God the Father says, That is God. Okay, well, well how can it be God the Father, uh, God the Son, and he's still you know, talk to us as man, and he's still got the son, and he's God. That's too much for our head. That's why his name is wonderful. Wonderful means what is beyond comprehension. Praise the Lord. So his nature is wonderful. Now, because something, you cannot comprehend something, that doesn't mean it's not true. Because if you say something is not true because I don't understand it, then that means you are the arbiter of everything there is, and that is a problem. <laughs> there are many things that are true that yet we don't understand. And that's one of them. Now, not only his nature, his life and his work was wonderful. He performed miracles, signs, and wonders that were never seen before. This Jesus healed the sick, he raised the dead, he turned water into wine, he walked on water, he cast out demons, he stilled storms. Even that the disciples said, what kind of a man is this? That even the storms are listening to him. It's one thing for sickness to listen to him. But this man is commanding the storm. This man is walking on water. Why? His works are wonderful. His name is wonderful. His death, resurrection, and ascension is wonderful. He said, kill this body, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, look, there is one thing that I think is easy sometimes, and, uh, and people that want to attack the words of Christ and what it did can easily just do to disprove it. 
All, they, all has to be done is replicate what Jesus did. Kill me in three days, I'll resurrect. How come no man has been able to do it for 2,000 years? That's why he set apart. <laughs> He's the only one that says, I will lay down my life, and in three days I will come back. They put stones there. They put guards there. Guard him very well. Make sure the disciples didn't come to steal him. With all of that, what happened? He's still resurrected. Praise the Lord. So much so that the Pharisees told the guard that tell the Roman uh, authority that his disciples came to steal him because if they knew that somehow he escaped, you are going to be killed. The Jesus that we serve, not even the grave could hold him down. Why? Because his name is wonderful. His name just means his characteristic, his attribute. His name and power are wonderful. Demons tremble at his name. The Bible says there was this demoniac of gather, gathering that saw him and bowed down. The man had legions. Nobody could hold him down. The Bible says he would break chains when they tied him. But as soon as the same man saw Jesus, he ran to him and he bowed down because he recognized that this is not just another Jewish man. This is God. His name, his power is wonderful. He's the only one that says, take my name anywhere and use it to cast out demons. Remember in the book of Acts, the Bible says there were people called the sons of Skeevers. They also say, well, we can, we, we can do miracles. If Paul and Peter can do it and they want to exercise a demon. The Bible says that one single man beat all four of them, or maybe seven of them, I don't remember exactly how many. He beat them and disgraced them. Why? Because he was trying to replicate what only the name of Jesus can do. Have you seen somebody that says, in the name of something, I cast you demons out? No, but the name of Jesus and his power is still wonderful. That's what sets him apart. Praise the Lord. His work in man's life today are wonderful. He's the only one that changes lives like nothing else, like no one else. This same Jesus will take a drug addict and turn him, turn him around and make him, you know, <laughs> an enviable person. He will take a prostitute that just says, Jesus, I receive you into my life, and make them somebody you say, I want my life to become. That's why it's wonderful. I was listening to a woman on the radio uh, this past week, and at the point that I came in there, uh, I believe she was saying this about herself, based on everything else she was saying about her conversion 30-something years ago. You know what, what I met her saying? She said, a woman that slept with three men in one night. And she said everybody knew her to walk that, you know, every night, every next work day is like, how was the party? But one night she went and gave her life to Christ. The next day she was talking about Jesus and people were saying, what happened to you? Jesus, where did you get that from? And she was so converted drastically that somebody else became a Christian through her, even though she had only been converted for a few weeks. And she had been walking with the Lord preaching for 30 something years. Who changed that? This same wonderful Jesus. He's the one that takes a drug addict and changes them. And they said, do you want to know if Jesus' power works? Look at my life. Look at my record. Who else transforms life like Jesus? Nobody else. That's why the Bible says his name is wonderful. He does what no man can do. That's why he's the only one that can save humanity, because he's doing it. It has been said that the greatest proof of Christianity it's not when we sit down and we say, this verse says that. that that's good to say that. It's, it's good to say archaeology says this. It's good to say even science. Are, all of that is good. But you know the greatest evidence is a changed life. That is the greatest evidence. You, everybody can argue with whatever you put, on, put down there. But, okay, somebody says, well, but okay, this is me. I was an exterior killer. Right now, I cannot stop loving people. What is your disproof? What is your proof to counter that? Nothing. Who changed me? They tell you it's Jesus. Somebody says I'm ex-homosexual, but, but now I give my life to Christ. I saw it. It was one of the Billy Graham uh, shows on the TV, and this lady was saying she was claiming to be a Christian, but she was living the gay life until she really, really had the true gospel, and she radically changed. By who? That same Jesus. That's why it's called wonderful. But you know what? Let me pause right here. There are many people that 
still have relationship with this same, same Jesus, but there is nothing wonderful about their lives. There isn't much change in their lives. There isn't much excitement in their lives. In fact, things, if, if you judge their life by the way you see it, it's just boring and, and sad. Why is it? If everything I'm saying is true, it changes uh, a gay, it changes uh, a drug addict, it changes this and that and that, it heals the sick, it casts out the demons, it walked on water, it turned water to wine. Why is it so that many believers' lives are not enviable, it's sad, it's depressing, it's, it's gloomy? I want to tell you, the reason is because they are not pressing into this Jesus, they just know him like a part-time relationship. They are on the fringes of relationship with God. When you have that kind of life, you may not experience the wonder of this Jesus because all that you have with him is a religious relationship. And we need to get beyond that. His power and presence is wonderful. He gives peace in the middle of the storm. How can you have peace while you're in the middle of the storm? Is that because I'm wonderful, I can do so? When you are facing death, he gives peace. We showed uh, a video here, I think last year or the year before, called Ka Kala Fetoka. It's the story, life story of a woman uh, convicted of murder, bad murder, heinous murder. He, she hacked somebody to death with an axe. So this is not like, you know, because she was drunk. And when they arrested her, she even spat in the face of the sheriff, like, I don't care. A notorious woman. But I'm talking about the wonderful Jesus. They put her in prison. The warder even hated her. Like, you, you, you are so bad that you, you, even the law enforcement people dislike you. But I'm talking about what Jesus did. When Jesus came into her life, she became the sweetest person in that place. And even though she had been given a death sentence, at her death, she was singing. That's what Jesus can do. He gave this woman, facing death by little injection, peace of mind. Why? Because her life has been so transformed and she knows exactly where she's going because of the relationship we have with Jesus. That's why the Bible says, he's called wonderful. You see a woman that is, is, does not fit for the society and you see a woman that everybody... Do you know, if you watch that story, the sheriff was now campaigning for her death sentence to be overturned. The people that say, we will see to it that you die, are the ones that say, well, this woman is too good to be put to death. What happened between the first and the last chapter of our life? Jesus. That's why the Bible says, rejoice because a savior is born to the world. He will save humanity from their worst enemy, which is Satan and sin. My question is, how come this same Jesus is in some people's life, but there isn't much difference? My answer is, you are not pressing into that Jesus. Let me tell, let me expand on that. Man loves wonder. For example, what happens when you are telling little kids fairy tales? Their eyes light up. All right? When you're telling them about all these, you know, imaginary things, things that don't really exist, and all this wonder that amazes their mind. They're like, really? They believe it, right? Why? Because we are made to actually long for things beyond what we can explain. You say, well, that's only for kids. It's not only for kids. Look at adults. We always like something that wows us. We always love something that is enigmatic, something that we think, you know, is going to get our juice going because there's something to pursue. That is the way we are wired. But the, the problem is this. None of those things can suspend, uh, sustain their wonders, except Jesus. Let me give you examples. Human beings, we've, we've made a lot of uh, wonderful things. I mean, think about the 1960s when America, you know, first step, stepped foot on the moon. I mean, you're like, really, seriously? Man could literally leave planet Earth and go as far as that place and come back. You understand? Look at the medical uh, technology we have. You know, we can literally 
do almost anything with DNA. There is genetic engineering whereby they're actually almost customizing baby. You can give them blue eyes. You can give them. I mean, there are so many amazing things that we can do. Look at, right now, the world of robotics. That's one of the things going on now that, you know, you want to make everything that, you know, the machine that will do everything like human beings. I saw the other day the, the robots that were performing push-ups. You understand? Know and it was, I mean, very, just basically the same way human beings do it. Okay? Here's where I'm going. It happens on your phone. You know, right now, maybe it's iPhone 8. Before you know it, iPhone 9 or 10 will come out. Guess what? People will line up to go and get it. So, in our daily life, we always love something that is charming, something that is amazing, new discovery, and everything. Here's the question. How long do the charms of this thing last? Very shortly. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you go out now, even if you can find it, would you go out and spend $10 on a black and white TV? Okay, let's say they are giving it for free. How many of us will not take it? <laughs> Why? But can you imagine the first time human being can see another human being in a box? They're like, what? <laughs> we Africans then, at least, well, maybe in my own local place, they say, ah, this is the white people's witch. <laughs> okay? How did they get this woman into this little box? You know, as I was, I, as a kid, I... <laughs> It's amazing what we think. I used to think, because I was very inquisitive, those people in those TVs got in there through the back. You understand? So sometimes I would go and people and say, ah, but how much space between this TV and the wall did this woman get in here and all of them are coming in <laughs> and out? Right? So it's amazing to see people in the TV, even though it's black and white and all this cloudy stuff on it, but when that thing came, and after a while, a few years, what came after? Color TV. The magic of black and white TV is gone. Then they now came out with those big, huge, you know, big screen. They are, I mean, they weigh like, I don't know, 60 pounds. You understand? <laughs> and when you have that, you're like, wow, I have a theater in my house. Right? They bought them for thousands of dollars. And after a while, they face that and they now have this plasma TV. So when you have those big, huge... TV with like some tube inside of them. He said, like, what are you doing with this stuff? Now we hang everything on the wall. And now they come with the curved one. And now they have, you know, 4K. They came with HD TV. And now 4K TV. Here is where I'm going. The magic, the wonder of the things that wow us. How long do they last before another one come out? Very little. The only person that sustains his wonder is Jesus. And so it is true that when the Bible says his name shall be called wonderful, man needs wonder as part of what will hold our attention. And that wonder is in Jesus. The second thing about the wonders of the world is with all our technology and the wonderful things we could do right in the palm of our hands, how much has that made humanity better? How much has that increased our morality as human beings? All the high tech that we have. So I want you to think about that. How, how, how has that made men better husbands? Because they have iPhone, they have every, all the technology. Is it producing better men? Is it producing better women? In fact, what, what is the effect of these things on the society? Positive or negative? When it comes to morality, negative. Do you get where I'm going? We have many wonderful things that draw our attention. But God says, how is that improving the morality of human beings? It's actually sending it south. The only wonder that brings us out of darkness is this one that is called wonderful. Now, back to what I was saying to you. So how come many of us don't experience this wonder of Jesus? Is everything I'm saying is true. Now, 
This is the reason I've explained what I've explained. Because we press into the temporary wonders of now that charm us, but we fail to press into Jesus. That's why we may not be experiencing his wonder. Many people will spend time on the gizmos, but they don't have 10 minutes to search the wonder of who Jesus is. Therefore, their spiritual life is nothing more than drudgery. Do you see that? Because we are pursuing the wonders of the world. But the wonders of the world gets us excited only a little bit, but it leaves us disappointed. You know, as I've been, as I've been um, observing lately, do you know what has been rising? With all the rise of technology and everything that anybody knows, one of the things that have been rising in popularity in America at least now is mother suicide. If you have been following, before it will be mother and the person will try to escape. Right now is a man that will kill himself. He will kill all the family and then kill himself. So go and sue wherever you want to sue. How come we are not getting more answers with all our technology? Because... No, but we are not investigating the wonder of Jesus that we serve. Two weeks ago, this man that was accused of sexual uh, impropriety, is one of the legislators, went to church, addressed his people on a Tuesday, Wednesday, he drives to a bridge, pulls out his gun, shoots himself. Why? We are pursuing the wonders of the world, but it leaves us so empty. Even though we have Jesus, there's no wonder we see in him. So what am I bringing out of this Christmas message? Just the first name of Jesus that says his name is wonderful. I want to tell you that there, if you press in to discover this Jesus, just as some people will sit down and want to know everything on their phone. They want to know everything that the technology is bringing. They want to know everything. Jesus says, if you are so enamored with those wonders that leave you, you know, to want more, how come are you not pressing into the Jesus you have? That is why many Christians' life is nothing wonderful. It is it's dark. It is, you know, even there are believers that if you advertise yourself as the, you know, poster child of Christianity, nobody wants Christianity. And yet you say the Jesus we serve is wonderful. Why? Why is there the difference between the wonderful Jesus and the sad Christian? Because the sad Christian carries the wonderful Jesus but has no time to investigate the wonderful Jesus. So my encouragement to us is this time of Christmas, let it, let it reignite your search and passion for this Jesus, to know him, to discover him, to see, to see if you can experience the wonder that is in him truly in your life. Because those other things that we spend our time after, I want to let you know that we always have to ask ourselves a question. They excite me for a while, but overall, how much of a better person do they leave me? They can't, because the only true wonder that can make you a better person is the wonder of who Jesus is. So I want to encourage us. Just on, we're only going to talk about just his name, wonderful. That song, I love the song, the song that says, his name is wonderful, his name is wonderful. Another hymn says, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. You can have an exciting life in Jesus. I'm not saying you can have, you are necessarily going to have a problem-free life. That's not, there are two different things. Having a problem-free life where you don't have any problem at all, that's not the same thing as having an exciting life. You can have an exciting life if we decide to press in into this Jesus. If you watch uh, around, you will see that, and if you have not noticed this, you should try. There are many people that live in third world countries in fact, some of them live in some of these, what do you call them, uh, countries like China and uh, some dictatorship countries that 
uh, really frowning against Christianity, but they are Christian underground. There are many people living in these conditions that are far happier than Christians living in America. Go and do your research. You'll find it. I say, well, how come they're alive? How are they more satisfied? They don't have all that I have. Because the wonders of what you have cannot satisfy your soul. I had the story of some of these Chinese underground Christians that they were asking them, what can we do for you? How can we help you? They said, well, the only thing you can do for us is to help us get Bibles. But you don't have money. Some of them were selling their blood. I'm not talking about fiction. They were donating their blood to do evangelism. And they're happy about it. Yeah. That is the wonder of Jesus when a person discovers and says, well, if this Jesus is all there is, then I want to know him. But look at one of the things rising in our society. Um, you, you, you should always be looking at what is going on so that the word of the Bible will come alive in you. Do you know another trend that is building in our society is the suicide of teenagers, little kids, killing themselves. About three weeks ago, a 12-year-old killed himself. That same week, a 10-year-old hung herself, and they were saying maybe because she watched the video of the 12-year-old that he hung herself. Now, what are 10 years old? What business do they have killing themselves and 12-year-olds in America? You know the problem? Because all the gizmos that you are giving them, all the wonders you are giving them, leaving their souls empty. They have no reason to live. Right now, when you talk to teenagers, I've talked to one of them that actually talked to me. When you talk to teenagers, one of the problems that teenagers are experiencing in our society is just the feeling of emptiness, the feeling of, and that's why many of them are killing themselves. Some of them kill themselves on the internet. You will see it. Why? They will say for bullying. Do you not see all these things? Okay, somebody talk about me that I have a long nose. And then they will write a note to their parents that, I'm sorry I'm taking my life because uh, people say I have a long nose. But look at that, that kid's house. He probably has a personal plasma uh, no, HD TV or 4K TV in his bedroom. He probably has iPhone 8 in his hand. He probably has things that even you adults don't have. Question is, how come all those wonderful things he has doesn't give him reason to live? Ah, the Bible says the Savior that is coming is the only wonder that can make your soul satisfied. So, just so that I'm not preaching to the choir, I'm not preaching to you as unbeliever, my challenge to us is that even though we know this Jesus, God wants us to experience the wonder of that Jesus. And when that happens, it's going to be more than just going to church. And the only way that can happen is if we care to press into him the way we care to press into everything else. That is one of the reasons why Jesus is the savior of the world. He holds wonders that sustains its power. He holds wonders that changes and transforms lives. Counselor. Maybe we'll, get, maybe we'll get to it later on. Three weeks ago, I think it was, a man, I don't remember his name. It's a tragic example, but this is what is going on in our world. He's a Jamaican man that built this beef party, cocoa bread something. I don't know if you read that story. Built it from scratch. And he's a successful man in New York, in Bronx, New York. That, you know, he has, I don't remember how many stores he has, you know, here. He's, he's a successful man. They said he drove his Tesla, went right in front of his store, shot himself to death. How many of you heard about it? Okay. And the employers were saying, uh, and former employers are saying, well, I mean, this is unlike him. This is the nicest guy. My question is, what happened in the head of that man that built a business from scratch, came in, from Jamaica, a poor man, become a millionaire. What happened at the peak of success that he drives his Tesla, picks a gun, and shoots himself? Do you think he's lacking for money? Here is the answer. The wonders of this world leave you empty at the end, even though you may have a lot of zeros after your name. You don't need to go to the moon to prove it. It's right around us. You say, well, Pastor, I don't have a lot of zeros around my, uh, behind my name, but... 
I'm not really a happy Christian. It's the same thing. If you don't press into the Jesus you have, you can still be a very sad Christian even without a lot of zeros behind your name. My challenge is, believers, it's a wonderful time, Christmas time. But could we just ask God, I want the excitement that is in Jesus. Yeah, with my problems and all, I know that we all have issues. God solved the problem, but that's, I've learned that I can be excited even with some of the issues in my life because your name is wonderful. Praise the Lord. That's the prayer I would, I would like us to pray. That will give significance to your Christian life. That will give excitement to your Christian life. That will give passion to our Christian life. Because we are meant to continually experience wonder. And that is why people change things over and over to get a new sense, a new sense, a new sentiment. That is why. That is why. That's why some people, if they have the money, they will buy the same kind of car. Every year it comes out the same color, the same everything. Why? Because one year, the charm of that one is already gone. Don't blame them because we are meant to experience charms. And we'll get it wherever we can. But what I'm saying is that Jesus said, I'm all the charms you need if you press into me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Do, would, we want, would you want to press more into the Lord? I think we should. I think we should. Because we live in the United States of America. But I've often said it. This state, this nation is the one that uses the most dosage of antidepressant. I read it. I didn't make it up. I was surprised when I was reading something. I mean, this totally blew me out. I was looking for something else, and I just stumbled on it. The country with most serial killer in, a, in the world. Guess where it is? America, by the thousands. The next one to it is like maybe over a thousand lower. So why? With everything we have, the charms, they don't do much for our soul. The charms, the dollar, the everything, they don't do much for our soul. But Jesus can do a whole lot more for our soul. Only if we will press in to him. Let's rise up on our feet.